Hi everyone, we are so pleased that you all could join us for this week's lecture in the No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would like to thank our sponsors for the generous financial support for this series. Before we start, we have a couple of disclaimers for the series. Um, this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box, which is on the lower left of your screen, and we will have a recording of today's lecture provided on our website later this week. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, we're so happy that everyone has joined us for this final lecture in our 12-week Volume 2 series. Um, we are already busy planning for volume three, and so we would really love your feedback so we can continue to improve in the new year. So keep an eye on your email today and fill out the survey for us. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ayrti Nair for today's lecture on neuropsychology of autism spectrum disorders. Dr. Nair is an assistant professor in the departments of psychology and pediatrics at Loma Linda University. She received her master's degree in clinical psychology from UNC Charlotte, and upon graduating from this program, she worked at the Center for Autism Research at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which sparked her longstanding interest in the neural substrates of autism spectrum disorder, as well as generally in neuropsychology. She continued this line of research as a graduate student in the SDSU UCSD joint doctoral program and obtained her PhD in neuropsychology in 2015. Dr. Nair completed her clinical internship and postdoctoral training at the UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Her research has been supported by grants awarded from Autism Speaks, Autism Science Foundation, and the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Nair's uh, current research interests are in the sub uh, neural basis of social cognition deficits in adolescents with autism spectrum disorder, as well as early onset psychosis. She is specifically interested in applying multimodal neuroimaging techniques to enhance and examine changes in neural architecture affected by targeted interventions in these populations. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Nair. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. Let me quickly share my screen here. Okay. All right. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for coming today to hear me present on my research efforts looking at altered neural connectivity in autism spectrum disorder and related neuropsychiatric conditions using multimodal imaging techniques. So I'm gonna start by giving you an overview of the empirical questions that have guided my research career so far. So first I will review some select prior research examining how key brain networks are altered in autism spectrum disorder and its association with symptom severity. Next, I will highlight how early in development these network alterations emerge, followed by how these network alterations in ASD compare to other neuropsychiatric um, disorders. And finally, um, how might treatment impact these network alterations in ASD and related neuropsychiatric disorders. So to begin with, let me tell you a bit about autism spectrum disorder. This is a pervasive neuro neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by a cluster of symptoms, most prominently impaired social communication and stereotyped or rep repetitive behaviors. So at this point, um, you know, it's well known that ASD is primarily related to genetic factors which uh, then cascade into abnormalities in um, cortical organization and brain connectivity. So these are microstructural neural disrupt disruptions that are considered predominant in the etiology of ASD. Um, and there is evidence for both under and over connectivity in ASD, suggesting that uh, there is poor segregation and integration of key brain networks. So when I first started in the field of ASD research, there was more interest in looking at disrupted cortical, cortical, cortical connectivity 
subcortical to cortical connectivity had been understudied at this time. But I think this was an important structure to consider um, because um, there is this, in this really nice meta-analytic study, um, the authors demonstrated that um, the connectivity between prefrontal cortex and the subcortex was uh, found to constitute a social cognition system characterized as the affect generation system. Um, and as such, the subcortex plays a pretty pivotal role in cognitive, affective, and social functions. So my primary interest as a researcher in terms of domains is social cognition. So, um, you know, I was attracted to learning more about the subcortex and its role in social cognition in ASD. So of specific interest to me was the thalamus, which is known to have extensive innovations with, uh, from social brain um, hubs in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the thalamus is a very complex brain structure described as a relay station um, or a gateway to the brain that routes all of the neural information received. So as such, it shapes, it pretty much shapes what people see, hear, feel, um, and uh, thus potentially plays a crucial role in routing social information to the cortex as well. So earlier, um, the thalamus was consigned to primarily being involved in sensory motor functions. Um, but as I mentioned, this is a complex structure and there it, it constitutes several distinct um, thalamic nuclei that you can see in this visual diagram here. Um, each of which is connected to a different cortical region. So as such, the thalamus is involved in several higher order cognitions, such as attention modulation, visuospatial functioning, uh, language processing, memory, as well as some executive functioning skills like working memory and set shifting. So um, disrupted thalamocortical circuits have uh, been implicated in multiple neuropsychiatric disorders characterized by deficits in these higher order cognitive processes such as schizophrenia, dementia, uh, multiple sclerosis as well. So at the time that I started this line of research, a uh, few studies had already found abnormal activation of thalamocortical networks, reduced thalamic volume, reduced white matter integrity of thalamocortical network uh, tracks, and lower neurometabolite concentrations in the thalamus in ASD. So with this background, I wanted to further our understanding of cortical alterations in ASD by examining um, functional and anatomical connectivity between the cerebral cortex and thalamus using resting state functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging. So there was not the expectation that the results between these two modalities would overlap one to one, uh, but rather that they would complement the findings from each other in um, furthering our understanding of thalamocortical connectivity in ASD. So for both modalities in this study, um, we had about 38 children and adolescents with ASD and 35 typically developing controls that were matched for gender, handedness, uh, age, as well as IQ. So let me give you a little bit of a um, insight into what resting state functional imaging is for those who are not as familiar. So this is a, a functional scan that is acquired when the participant is not engaging in any task in, during the uh, scan. So they're passively viewing a blank screen. Um, and the idea is that um, we will see some low frequency spontaneous uh, correlations between brain regions at rest that is not influenced by a specific type of cognitive task. So then regions that are highly correlated are considered to be functionally related in these scans. And uh, the way we sort of um, determine impacted functional synchrony is to see if a network is maybe underconnected or overconnected compared to the pattern seen for healthy controls. So um, here is a one of the first studies that looked at used resting state functional connectivity in a, um, in human samples and uh, 
this on this panel here, um, sorry, I can't use my cursor. Okay. Shows, uh, you can see the one on the, uh, um, on the left is a is the rest scan and they basically wanted to see if um, the motor network in the brain is connected at rest and they were able to demonstrate that and see that it's actually pretty similar to the panel that you see on the um, on the right which is the activation one um, and that I think is actually a thing a bilateral finger tapping task so you know they sort of demonstrated that resting state scans up can pretty well simulate um, brain networks at rest that look similar to what would be expected to be engaged while do, doing, a, doing a task. So for this study, we um, kind of followed a similar approach. We wanted to look at uh, the connectivity between five cortical regions of interest or ROIs, and those were the prefrontal, a combined parietal occipital, motor region, somatosensory cortex, and then the temporal lobes with bilateral, bilateral thalamus. Um, so in terms of results, here's what we found for our typically developing controls. So what you're looking at here is a very zoomed in view of the thalamus um, in, from the entire brain scan. So, you know, you can see that there's some pretty distinct connectivity patterns between these five different regions of interest and what looks like different nuclei of the thalamus. Um, but when we look at the autism group, we find already looking at the within sample findings that you know these connectivity patterns already sort of seem to look a bit altered for this group. And then when we run a group test, we see, um, so here the blue clusters represent um, you know, areas that the ASD group was underconnected compared to the control group. And then the yellow clusters would be where they were overconnected compared to the control group. So you can see for most of these ROIs that there is um, underconnectivity in this ASD sample, except for the temporal uh, region. Here you're seeing clusters of overconnectivity uh, that seem to be spilling into other sort of thalamic nuclei than what would typically be associated with the, uh, with the temporal lobe. So these ROIs that we used in this first study are pretty large brain areas. And, uh, you know, like the prefrontal cortex, for example, can, it, it contains so many different functionally separate regions that are involved in various different cognitive processes. So we wanted to then next look at uh, the specificity of our findings by examining smaller regions of interest within these five main brain areas. Um, for which we use what is called the Harvard Oxford Cortical Atlas. Um, so um, here you can see there's a lot of findings, a lot of different brain regions, but the overarching theme that we found was that there was underconnectivity between higher order and later maturing cortical regions uh, with the thalamus that's represented by these blue lines. And there was overconnectivity between the early maturing limbic regions and thalamus, such as cingulate and medial temporal structures, um, represented again by these red lines um, for the ASD group. So next we wanted to see um, what the structural connectivity between the five main cortical ROIs and thalamus look like, which we did using um, DTI or diffusion tensor imaging. So diffusion tensor imaging measures diffusion of water molecules along white matter tracks. Um, in typical development, we might expect changes in the DTI metrics, such as there would be an increase in white matter density or increase in the fiber counts. There would also be increased um, directionality of the diffusion of water molecules, which is uh, called fractional anisotropy. Um, and then, Relatedly, we would see overall reduced diffusion, which is, you know, that, that there is sort of like a directionality and constraint of the way the water molecules flow through the flow along white matter tracks, rather than just sort of spreading in all directions. Okay, so uh, diffusion itself has three main indices that is usually looked at in diffusion tensor imaging. So there's axial diffusivity, which is 
um, diffusion that, that is parallel to the white matter tract. There's radial diffusivity, which is perpendicular to white matter tracts, and then mean diffusivity is a mean of the axial and radial diffusivity. So we started by examining uh, the density of fiber count in thalamocortical networks in the two groups. So here we found robust and distinct representation of fiber tracts between each cortical ROI and the thalamus, but not as much for the ASD group in comparison. So in the group test as well, you can see that the ASD group had lower fiber counts in all of the thalamocortical tracts compared to controls. So next we wanted to examine the traditional DTI indices of anisotropy and diffusivity for each of these tracts. And here we found, uh, we didn't find any big differences in anisotropy between two, the two groups, but in terms of diffusivity, we found higher um, or more atypical mean diffusion in the ASD group for uh, prefrontal and sensory motor tracts, which uh, seem to be driven mostly by atypical radial diffusivity in the ASD group. So radial diffusivity is considered a marker of uh, demyelination or uh, alterations in axonal diam diameter or density compared to axial diffusivity, which is more related to axonal injuries. So, um, you know, we're seeing that there is not as much constraint or directionality of water diffusion in uh, these particular tracks in the ASD group compared to controls. So there was a lot of, a lot of different brain <laughs> Findings. So just to summarize, um, what we found is functional overconnectivity for limbic and sensory motor regions, but underconnectivity for associative higher order cortical regions in the ASD group, ASD children and adolescents specifically. Um, functional differentiation of the thalamus will seem to be impacted, you know, where the, the temporal thalamic connectivity was kind of spilling into other nuclei of the thalamus that would be typically associated with different cortical regions, um, which may suggest poor network integration and segregation in this group. Uh, the white matter integrity was also compromised, especially for thalamic prefrontal and thalamic sensory motor tracts. So re recent theories have sort of suggested that the thalamus may serve as a bridge between the medial temporal lobe and the frontal cortex. But what we found is that the temporal networks um, occupying thalamic nuclei in the AST was at an expense of some other networks such as the thalamic prefrontal network. So this may indicate a potential disruption in that subcortical prefrontal affect generation subsystem that I showed you initially. So next we wanted to see now, what does this mean for real world behaviors in ASD group, right? So uh, what do these brain, how do these brain disruptions related to real, relate to real world behaviors? So to assess this, we administered uh, some measures of social functioning really, um, which include the um, ADOS, which is a uh, clinician administered measure of current symptom severity. Uh, we also administered the ADIR, which is a parent interview of the emergence of ASD symptoms in early childhood years, because, you know, to have the diagnosis of autism, you have to have the history of it starting before the age of five or six. And we also had a, a parent or caregiver report of current social concerns. So that was the SRS, um, which includes subscales measuring various aspects of reciprocal social behavior. So our brain behavior correlations reveal that um, the prefrontal thalamic underconnectivity that we saw for the AST group was uh, associated with higher symptom severity scores, both on the ADOS and the ADIR. It was also, um, associated with higher um, ratings on, of parent concerns of current social functioning. And additionally, the thalamic temporal overconnectivity that we saw was also associated with higher um, report of parent concerns of current social functioning. For the DTI indices, we found mostly um, with the radial diffusivity that again, the prefrontal 
region um, increased diffusivity, which is the more atypical diffusivity, was associated with higher um, early symptoms of um, autism, as well as current parental concerns about social functioning. Okay. So in terms of our brain behavior associations, we, the, these suggest that the atypical functional and anatomical uh, prefrontal and temporal thalamic connectivity was the one that was related to both sort of the social interaction as well as um, repetitive stereotype behaviors that are characteristic of autism spectrum disorder on those diagnostic measures. So then these findings made me wonder if these, um, these neural alterations that I just showed you are a product of having ASD for several years when we've studied them in childhood or adolescence, or is it part of the underlying mechanism that propels ASD individuals on sort of a atypical developmental trajectory? So to answer this, I wanted to then examine how early in development do these network alterations emerge? So this we did by using what is known the, as the infant sibling approach. Um, so why infant siblings? Um, the CDC prevalence rates for autism are currently around one in 59 children. Um, in comparison, uh, siblings are at a higher risk rate for ASD. So there's a 20% ASD recurrence rate in siblings, uh, as well as a 40% suboptimal developmental outcomes rate in these um, sibling groups of individuals with ASD. So with these infants, I wanted to examine how, uh, examine the early developmental trajectories and patterns of uh, thalamocortical connectivity in what we call the high risk infant group, which is the infants that are at higher familial risk because of having a sibling with ASD. And um, kind of hope that these uh, help identify how um, thalamocortical connectivity in, um, high-risk infants may relate to early behavioral outcomes and may you know, potentially um, serve as a biomarker for familial risk prior to the onset, onset of overt symptoms of ASD. So this is, um, this is data that I'm going to present to you from the UCLA Infant Sibling Study, which is a longitudinal study where kids come in at the age of six weeks after birth for an MRI scan. They then get um, eye tracking at about nine months and also um, a set of diagnostic and uh, social functioning assessments at the age of 36 months. So we specifically focused on these three time points in, in, in my study, wherein, wherein we could measure sort of early social outcomes in a um, dimensional way using multimodal techniques. So for this study, we had about 23 high-risk um, infants. Again, their age was about six weeks post-birth. And uh, we had 25 controls uh, who are called low-risk controls. Um, and they are uh, basically infants that have no prior family history of ASD or any other related neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, groups were matched on gender and mean age. And the methods that we use were pretty much the same as before uh, with the older ch children and adolescents with ASD uh, for both functional connectivity and DDI, um, just using a different sort of atlas. It's a UNC neonate atlas this time. So for our results with this group, we found for the low risk infants that um, amazingly, that even at this young age, you start to al already see some distinct patterns of thalamocortical connectivity um, emerge. And it, it, in you know, when you compare this group with the older controls, we find that it is trending in what we see with older, typically developing controls. And I, I know it's a bit hard to look at what, you know, what are we looking at here uh, with the infant brains because of differences in myelination and things compared to adult brains, but um, this, these circled areas roughly correspond to the thalamus in these um, neonates, newborn infants. Um, in comparison for the high-risk infants, we see, you know, quite some different patterns emerge pretty early on in development, 
especially with the prefrontal cortex. So in the prefrontal cortex, you are, you're seeing almost this opposite pattern of connectivity compared to con uh, low risk controls, which we uh, think might have to do with low reciprocity between the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus, or maybe a down regulation of the prefrontal thalamic network compared to other thal uh, thalamocortical networks in these high risk infants. And um, our group significance tests uh, revealed additional areas of atypical thalamocortical connectivity, specifically the occipital and motor thalamic um, networks. So for corresponding DTI analysis, we only found significant group differences in DTI indices for thalamic occipital networks. So all of the diffusivity indices axial, radial, mean diffusivity were all impacted in the high-risk group where the high-risk group showed higher overall diffusion compared to the um, low-risk controls. And interestingly, this was the only region where we saw some overlap between the DTI and functional overconnectivity findings, you know, where you see kind of increased diffusion in the DTI tracks, or uh, the white matter tracks, and um, in overconnectivity for the functional networks. Okay, so collectively these results might suggest that the thalamocortical connectivity is altered as early as the first weeks of life in um, high-risk infants. Um, the high-risk infant uh, group actually showed thalamocortical connectivity pat patterns trending in similar directions to older ASD individuals. So uh, with overconnectivity with the primary sensory motor regions and underconnectivity with higher order association cortices like the prefrontal um, region. In, um, in sort of developmental psychology, there is this theory that we switch from primarily reflexive subcortically controlled um, actions at the age of, uh, at the age of about six to eight weeks post-birth to more cortically driven um, um, actions um, at this age. So what this might suggest, because we are scanning them at this age and we are seeing these uh, network disruptions at this age, is that there might be an alteration or delayed sort of switching process from subcortical to cortical control in these high-risk infants. Okay. So next we wanted to see how these early neural alterations in infants tie into real world um, early social behaviors. So for this, we used an eye tracking free viewing paradigm, which is basically the infants are looking at a clip from the Charlie Brown Christmas movie at age nine months. So eye tracking is a great uh, way for early examination of social functioning in these young participants, as we would expect interest in faces and interest in smiling and talking faces at this point in development. So we computed, um, uh, looking time spent looking at the social uh, scenes, especially we characterize time spent looking at um, the faces compared to the background sort of perceptually salient features like motion or high luminance, high saturation. For the low risk infants, we found that um, increased thalamic, thalamic prefrontal connectivity strength was associated with a greater time spent looking at faces at age nine months. And also uh, time spent looking at faces over the background sort of salient perceptual features. Um, in comparison, we did not find this association for the high risk infants between thalamic prefrontal connectivity and face or social scene viewing. And that's probably related to the under connectivity that we saw for this network in this group. Um, for our uh, DTI findings, however, we did find that for the high-risk infants, the increased radial diffusivity, which is more atypical, was associated with more time spent looking at those background perceptually salient features compared to faces at age nine months. Additionally, for the high-risk infants, we found that um, the thalamic occipital overconnectivity was associated with greater, um, sorry, higher scores of uh, higher severity scores on the diagnostic measure, the ADOS, as well as with higher um, parent ratings of social um, functioning concerns. <clears throat> 
So these brain behavior um, investigations suggest that the atypical thalamocortical, functional and anatomical connectivity uh, on prefrontal and temporal thalamic networks of prefrontal and th temporal thalamic networks predicts um, poor attention to social information such as faces and an eventual diagnosis of ASD. And so, um, you know, it is probably important to identify earlier timeframes for targeted interventions for this group that may help steer uh, brain behavior development down more normative pathways, um, you know, especially if intervention occurs before the onset of overt symptoms of ASD. So that'll be an interesting next step to look at with these infant sibling studies. All right, so thus far I've presented some of my select prior research findings uh, on network connectivity alterations in ASD. And my, my more recent research interests right now correspond to how these network alterations in ASD compare to other groups of neuropsychiatric disorders with some um, similar phenotypic characteristics. So some of these similar phenotypic uh, characteristics um, such as difficulties in social cognition um, are a they're a hallmark feature of several neuropsychiatric disorders beyond ASD. So for instance, uh, schizophrenia is a syndrome that is characterized by negative symptoms as well as social impairments. Um, there has been a lot of research established at this point about the genetic and behavioral overlap between ASD and schizophrenia. In comparison, less is known about the um, neural sort of um, alterations across these two groups. So towards the same, I obtained uh, an NIMH grant, a uh, K99 grant to examine the neural mechanisms underlying shared and unique social cognition deficits in um, adolescents with ASD, as well as early onset schizophrenia. And I'm particularly interested um, as a researcher in the domain of social cognition, cognitive functioning um, in the period of adolescence, because um, this is an age where the consequences of uh, poor social interactions can be pretty devastating and uh, can also add to the diagnostic confusion between the two groups clinically. So here's um, a multi-system mechanistic model I'm proposing um, that might reflect how the overlapping genetic vulnerabilities in these two groups may impact uh, similar brain circuits, but in, in some crucially divergent ways. So for the ASD group, uh, we might expect that, or there has been prior work done that, uh, that suggests that um, there is uh, alteration in neurometab neurometabolite concentrations in the brain, um, such that you, know, you would expect a higher rate of uh, excitatory neurometabolites, um, such as glutamate, and lower concentration of inhibitory neurometabolites like GABA. In comparison, schizophrenia studies have found that there is a hypofunction in both the glutamate as well as GABA system. So you would expect lower glutamate and lower GABA for this group. Um, additionally, there's um, studies that have looked at, uh, these all cross-sectional studies that have looked at um, or have found reduced inter-social network connectivity in the ASD group um, that they believe um, characterizes a, what is considered under-mentalizing in these groups, in the ASD group. Um, in comparison, in schizophrenia, what has been found is increased connectivity between social brain networks with extraneous networks um, and may reflect a process of over-mentalizing in the schizophrenia group. And, you know, we'd expect that these neural patterns may then parlay into what we see, what are the observed sort of um, social differences between these groups, where which is characterized as lower social motivation and poor social reciprocity in the ASD group, uh, but but lower social expressivity and higher misattributions in the um, schizophrenia group. So with this study, we're getting closer to data completion after some COVID-related delays. And so thus far, we've recruited about 25 um, ASD adolescents, 17 adolescents with schizophrenia. So that includes a diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or schizophreniform disorder within the past two to three years. 
onset two to three years. And then also we have controls and they are not age or IQ matched or gender matched yet, but hopefully they will be when we finish recruitment. So first I'm gonna show you some preliminary results examining the concentration of neurometabolites, especially in the AST group. Okay. So um, we use magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is a technique that measures the neurochemical composition of brain tissues. Um, and analyzes molecules such as um, hydrogen ions and protons that are products of neurometabolism. So my interest was in measuring excitatory and inhibitory neurometabolites, which are, uh, as opposed to brain images, are represented uh, uh, by frequency of the, uh, by like a frequency graph with peaks of varying heights. So this is what an MRS result looks like. And each of these peaks uh, typically corresponds to a very specific neurometabolite. Um, so those who are familiar with MRS will know that this is not like the other brain scans, and it takes quite a long time to acquire neurometabolite concentrations in a very small region. So you kind of have to pick and choose the region of interest beforehand. And so I decided to acquire data in the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, because it overlaps across, um, this is a region that overlaps across multiple different cognitive networks. And this particular little window that you're seeing here of what we acquire takes about 20 minutes to get data on. All right, so the ACC, why is this important? It's a integrative social brain hub that's known to be crucial in social cognition. Going back to that two-factor social network, the ACC is closely connected to um, both and helps transition both between the affect generation system as well as the uh, default mode networks that you'll see here. Okay, so altered connectivity has been found in both ASD and schizophrenia, and uh, but the neural uh, neurochemical alterations and uh, related new connectivity patterns across both groups remains unexplored. Okay. So this is um, the, the yellow region of interest corresponds to where we accumulated our um, glutamate data. And what we found with our preliminary findings is that the ASD group um, shows a trend towards higher glutamate compared to uh, just the controls for now. Okay. And that this higher glutamate in the ACC in the ASD group is associated with higher um, symptom severity scores on the ADOS diagnostic measure. Okay. So next I wanted to look at the functional connectivity patterns of this region, the ACC across these two groups. So here we use the ACC mass from the Harvard Oxford Atlas to run a whole brain connectivity analysis and found that the um, ASD group um, was underconnected compared to the control group, specifically with inferior medial and temporal lobe structures, um, such as the fusiform face area, which is involved in face processing, the parahippocampal gyrus, which is involved in multiple things, but uh, memory, visual spatial functioning, and uh, the parahippocampal gyrus has more recently been um, thought to be also be involved in sarcasm detection. So it does have some involvement in social functioning. In comparison, we found the schizophrenia group um, was overconnected. The ACC was overconnected in the schizophrenia group, um, specifically with the precuneus cortex. And this was for uh, the comparison between schizophrenia group and controls, as well as schizophrenia group and the ASD group. Okay, so precuneus is the most, most famous for being a major brain um, hub region of the default mode network. So um, this is a widely studied, the default mode network, um, you probably have been exposed to this by now, but this is the most widely studied resting state functional network. It's considered to be active during rest, but not during TAS. We don't exactly know all the different things it's involved in, but it is involved in multiple different domains um, and is thought to be critical for social cognition as well. Um, and in our two-factor model, it actually represents the, um, the last half of this model, which is um, they've labeled as the simulation subsystem. Okay. 
Um, the hubs of the default mode network typically involve uh, prefrontal structures, medial prefrontal structures, and the precuneus or posterior cingulate cortex. This is also a region that has been, or network that has been found to um, be altered in its connectivity in both ASD and schizophrenia groups in cross-sectional studies. Um, and what it seems like from these studies is that there's a trend towards underconnectivity in the ASD group with mixed findings in the schizophrenia group. Okay. So for this, we uh, placed a seed in the posterior cingulate cortex um, and did a whole brain connectivity analysis and found once again that the ASD group demonstrated underconnectivity of the precuneus. Um, mostly with the posterior hubs of the default mode network compared to controls. Um, the schizophren schizophrenia group, on the other hand, demonstrated overconnectivity of both the uh, posterior as well as anterior hubs of the default mode network compared to, con uh, compared to the ASD group. We did not see group differences between schizophrenia and um, controls at this point. Okay. So, the preliminary data from the uh, K99 study provides some support for my mechanistic models, uh, such as the hyperglutamatergic action in frontal social hubs in ASD, um, and that that's associated with symptom se severity in this group. Um, as, a, as well as we see some evidence for frontal social networks uh, being underconnected in ASD, but overconnected in the schizophrenia group. So the next step will be to examine how these um, neural alterations relate to social cognition at the behavioral level once we finish data collection. All right, so lastly, in the last few minutes, um, this brings me to my current study as a faculty member where I'd like to apply the knowledge accumulated from the K99 phase um, to the generation of effective treatment models and in particular examine how treatment um, may impact these network alterations in ASD and other related neuropsychiatric disorders. So as you can see, a lot of my prior research work has focused predominantly on neuroimaging. I've trained mostly with neuroscientists. Uh, with this study, I'm hoping to get more into the translational clinical research space, combining my background with imaging, neuropsych, as well as treatment in, in sort of one translational study. So the questions I'm interested in asking in this study are, um, how do social skills interventions specifically impact the organization of large scale brain networks um, implicated in social cognition in both these groups? Um, will we see neural responses in social brain regions look more neurotypical following treatment in both groups? So maybe there'll be a shift and there'll be greater connectivity in social brain networks in ASD and lower connectivity of these extraneous regions in schizophrenia group following um, targeted intervention? Or will there be differential uh, compensatory mecha mechanisms in place for each group? So maybe there's a recruitment of additional brain networks or regions to help support uh, gaining um, more um, functional sort of social skills from treatment. And then, you know, as most of these studies I've uh, presented, I'm also interested in looking at if these neural responses post intervention will correlate with real world um, social gains in both groups. So for this study, we aim to recruit about 30 um, adolescents with ASD and 30 adolescents with schizophrenia. Um, they will come in for sort of a pre treatment set of MRI scans and behavior assessments. Then they will go through a social skills intervention, which for the purpose of this study, I'm using the UCLA peers intervention, which is a 16 week parent assisted social skills intervention for um, youth with ASD and um, neuropsychiatric disorders. And then following the 16 weeks, they'll have a post treatment assessment session where we'll again do the scans. Um, the scans will include the same ones I use for my K99 project. So that would be functional, structural, and spectroscopy scans. And then the assessments uh, will be more expanded for this current study compared to what I've done before. So um, I'm interested in obtaining data on domains that I think will be impacted in both groups. So 
social cognition, executive functioning are likely to be affected in both groups, um, as well as certain psychiatric comorbidities like ADHD or anxiety disorders are pretty highly represented in both these groups. Um, but then I'm also interested in getting data on um, a domain like memory, which might have very different profiles for these two groups. So there, you know, memory tends to be pretty well preserved, sometimes even an area of um, relative strength in the ASD group, um, but tends to decline with the um, onset of symptoms in the schizophrenia group. So lastly, I want to just uh, take a couple of minutes to show you some preliminary preliminary data we've acquired so far that helps support these proposed goals. Um, so for this uh, study, we are also introducing a functional task called the Understanding Communicative Intent Task. And this aligns well with the type of deficits that are targeted in the uh, peer social skills intervention. So your participants will engage in an audiovisual task where they're presented with comic strip scenarios, such as John and Linda went uh, want to go swimming at the beach. And then they either get a sincere uh, version of the story, which would be they get to the when they get there, the sky is blue and sunny and john says, what a perfect day. Or they get a sarcastic scenario, which is when they get there, the sky turns dark and rainy and john says, what a perfect day. So there is a change in the tone of voice and the picture that is shown and they are asked if they um, if the character meant what they said. So the task taps into domains such as irony and sarcasm detection. So in a previous study, um, data from about 18 individuals with ASD and 18 controls, um, these are adolescents again, showed greater activity um, um, in the control group than the uh, autism group in um, left frontal temporal region. So mostly left medial prefrontal cortex and some um, temporal pole regions. So as you can see, the theme of this frontal temporal under connectivity or under activation has been persistent in my ASD work so far. Um, so in a pilot study we ran uh, for ASD adolescents undergoing the UCLA Pierce treatment program, adolescents with ASD showed significantly greater activity at the post-intervention scan. So this is um, data just from post-scan compared to pre-treatment scan. And these um, orange clusters represent um, areas that showed significantly greater activity in this group post-treatment. So these are mostly all um, social communication regions like the temporal pole, temporal parietal junction, um, suggesting that even a brief intervention such as this can impact neural connectivity in, um, in positive ways. All right, so lastly, you know, I would eventually like to establish uh, myself as a researcher of social cognitive processes across various different um, neuro neurodevelopmental sort of uh, populations. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm particularly interested in doing this work with adolescents because uh, the consequences of your rejection or acceptance is pretty high at this age. And uh, I hope that, you know, um, my research along these lines will contribute significantly towards establishing the utility of um, neuroimaging and neuropsychology, uh, neuropsych assessments as a useful tool to measure active mechanisms in treatment related changes. Right. And with that, I just want to end by thanking you for your attention and also to the various members of the labs that I've worked with on this project, on these projects in the previous years, all our participants, um, funding sources over the years. And I'm happy to take any questions about what I presented. Thank you so much, Dr. Nair. Um, we do have a few questions in the Q&A. So we'll start with one uh, based on your future directions for research. Okay. Uh, so based on your future research questions in this area, do you have any hypotheses about the social skills intervention that you proposed? Uh, specifically in that context, do you think that there may be developmental differences for those with earlier intervention versus later intervention? Um, in general, at least in, the, in, in both the groups actually, in autism as well as schizophrenia, 
earlier intervention is always um, recommended more than later intervention. With the infant siblings, we don't yet have so much data where we can say yes, for sure that the early intervention makes a huge difference in uh, steering them away from the pathway of autism, or maybe it just you know reduces the severity of symptoms. So um, that same group at UCLA, in fact, is undertaking um, treatment studies with infants. So you know, hopefully in a couple of years, they'll have the data to tell us how that plays out. Um, with schizophrenia, the early social intervention is actually turning out to be pretty key. Um, we obviously want them to get uh, stabilized on medication and other kinds of outpatient um, psychiatric support first. You know, they can't be actively psychotic, that at that point of time, your social skills are not really the priority. But generally, more recent work is finding that um, one, of the, uh, one of the best predictors of poor outcomes in that group is actually the negative symptoms versus the positive symptoms, because the negative symptoms are also um, less, are more resistant to medication and other kinds of treatment. So um, it is actually kind of important for us to push the field in the direction of getting early, in, early social intervention for those um, adolescent groups, because that is actually, has been shown to put them on better trajectories with the psychosis um, over time. Excellent, that certainly makes sense. Um, and we'll look forward to some of those future, your future work as well as the work you just mentioned. Um, next question is from one of our viewers. It says, uh, I was curious to know a little bit more about whether or not there are studies examining the default mode network or the ACC in younger kids with ASD in early childhood um, since intervention would be critical for outcome. And right. this question also for schizophrenia, so maybe a prodromal phase. Yes, there's actually a lot of studies for the prodromal psychosis phase. Um, maybe not so mu as much for childhood psychosis, you know, so psychosis that comes on very early, like eight, nine years old, because um, the idea in the field seems to be that that is kind of a whole other process than first episode psychosis in adolescence or prodromal psychosis, that there might be, you know, more sort of genetic, I mean, it's all genetic, right? All of these conditions are genetically related, but that there might be a, maybe a heavier genetic load of some sort in those early childhood psychosis cases. So unfortunately those tend to be excluded from research studies and I am not particularly aware of a study that's focused just on those very early childhood psychosis cases. Um, the um, the uh, one about ASD with young children, um, you know, scanning is hard. <laughs> with that age range. Um, so that has typically been the challenge in the field is to get these younger kids. We know that they are important to study, but um, scanning is kind of hard with them. So specifically with default mode network, um, there have been studies that have looked at um, eight and over and they do find um, differences, you know, like that um, earlier on, some of it might be like more overconnected and then it becomes underconnected in the adolescent years, there is sort of some uh, developmental pattern that is being established by research. And, um, but there are more and more groups also specifically like training themselves to scan young kids better. So I know my former mentor at uh, San Diego State University and his collaborators have a study that is looking at like three to five year olds. Um, that is potentially something that on a, on a separate study that I and my collaborators at Loma Linda are also talking about, about scanning young kids um, between the ages of like three and eight um, and try to capture that. But um, yeah, it, it requires a certain level of training yourself to be able to you know um, get good scanning data from that age group. Right, kids don't exactly want to sit still. <laughs> exactly. Um, next question, I think relates to your um, pre and post treatment scans for your future research study that you mentioned. Um, so this person asked how far out were the post treatment scans um, and are the effects lasting both in neuroimaging findings and in behavioral social phenotypes? So maybe it's not about the, the future study. I'm unclear um. which one. <laughs> 
Great question though, uh, very important for us to examine. This particular study that's up here that I presented on the preliminary data, they were scanned right after the end of the 16 week treatment. So within a week of the treatment being done and same with the pre-scan was a week before they started treatment. Um, the, um, we don't have imaging data. There aren't a lot of studies that are looking at imaging pre and post treatment. So we don't have like a lot of good data yet about uh, how long-term these neural changes continue. That will ideally be my next R grant, <laughs> you know, once I have some data to support it from this study. Um, but uh, behaviorally, the peers group, I know at least for sure, that's the one I'm exposed to the most, has pretty good data. You can look up the UCLA peers website um, and they have their publications on there and they have some data that show um, pretty good behavior, like consistent behavioral gains, even at a five year mark. Um, and I think that's for ASD and maybe also ADHD. So it's like at least across a couple of different groups. Okay. Um, the next question uh, was submitted and it's, it's a rather lengthy question, but I think the overarching uh, theme is, do you plan to collect uh, sleep EEG data? in your, or electrophysiological data in your studies in the future, given some of the differences that this um, submitter cites for ASD sleep spindles. Very interesting. Um, I actually, in my recent position, have, we, we are writing a grant that's due tomorrow about sleep in ASD. But at this point, we're only um, going to start by collecting behavioral data on sleep in ASD and maybe it'll be more related to even like COVID related sleep changes in sleep patterns. Um, eventually the idea will be to do some imaging of them because you know, that's my expertise, but we do have uh, the, the people that do, uh, you know, that are the experts at sleep in at Loma Linda University, um, they do have a EEG lab. So that is a potential thing we would want to add kind of in these long-term plans. Definitely. Um, last question, I think for the day, we might have time for one more. Um, ASD has a strong genetic origin, like you mentioned. Um, are there any interventions or treatments that you are aware of for pregnant women to engage with in order to change or reduce the in utero uh, trajectory for siblings of ASD? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I mean, I think that would also take being able to do scans in utero to see what's happening at that stage. Like at this point, we know what's happening six weeks on. And I think that's the youngest we know right now in autism from what I'm aware. There's, you know, there's several different infant sibling studies um, in the United States. And um, the six weeks time point is one of the earliest, um, but an in utero study, I would not, I think that is something that people will start to do next. And that will then help inform if there are things that we can do. But there are some other things like, you know, obviously in utero exposure to toxins, drugs do put people on this trajectory of uh, increased risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. So that kind of psychoeducation is something that can be done with pregnant women about nutrition, about, um, about you know, avoiding drugs and, and uh, types of toxins that people might not be familiar with at that stage. That's something you would do for all sort of pediatric um, developmental conditions. Definitely. Um, we have one more question. I, I want to be respectful of your time. Do you have availability for this last question or should we yeah, follow sure. up afterwards? Well, we can, I can, I can take it. Okay. Um, so functional overconnectivity in the context of structural underconnectivity, um, this person says seems somewhat counterintuitive. Um, how do you interpret this in the context of your work? Right, so uh, it does seem counterintuitive looking at it, you know, just the way the data are presented, you know, these are very static data that we're acquiring in like a 10 minute period of a scan um, versus sort of, you know, something more dynamic that would tell us more, but um, more and more, I think just in the neuroimaging field, people are not expecting that these two modalities would tell us the exact same thing. Like it wouldn't be that one is underconnected, so the other one is also underconnected. Uh, one is looking at cortical connectivity, how different cortical regions are at the synaptic level, like talking to each other. 
Um, the other one is talking more about also how they're talking to each other, but looking at the white matter pathways that helps that communication. So this is something that's very pervasive in the autism literature that it's, it's, there's so many mixed findings and we're still trying to make sense of it. What we know at this point is just that these are so microstructural, right? You're not looking at a brain scan and are able to pinpoint like, oh, here's a tumor or here's a growth or something that is always related to autism. Um, so, you know, as, um, you know, the correspond or the, I think just at a theoretical level, uh, trying to understand how we should be putting these two data together is still something that I think, you know, people who are the real experts like at physics and things are, are trying to figure out. Um, so this is a very, very uh, overarching question in doing multimodal research in how do you put these two together? I do not have a good answer for it in, right now. I don't believe that the experts have a good answer for it right now. I, I just personally think that they complement each other in informing us that these, these particular networks are altered at both the functional as well as the structural level. And what we do next with that, we still sort of have to, you know, I'm still figuring out. Thank you so much for answering that last question. I think that was an, an important point that you really were able to answer quite well. Um, so thank you so much for this presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going out with, with an excellent one. So thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, happy holidays, everyone. Bye. Bye.